Good morning. It is 10.05, Wednesday, May 27th. This is the TDN Writers' Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. Hi, I'm Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News and would like to note today is closing day for historic Fodder Park. Jonathan Green, General Manager for DJ Stable. And this morning while working out, I actually watched Korean baseball. Working out. I can tell, John. Looking good. Um, the, the, the most surprising part of that statement was the workout, <laughs> not the crazy baseball, of, right, Brian? A little bit of a hum, humble brag, but uh, Brian Di well, Nato. <laughs> trying to tee it up for you. <laughs> Brian Di Nato, racing editor at the TDN, managing partner of Franklin Ave Equine. And see mom and dad, I finally trimmed the beard a little bit so you can get off my case every time I'm on the podcast. I trimmed the beard last week for your benefit so you could look even better with the beard. <laughs> now you're, you're with me. All right. Yeah. The TDN Writers Room is presented by Keeneland. A reminder that wagering through Keeneland Select is a great way to support the hardworking backstretch community right now. Proceeds from all wagers placed through Keeneland Select this month will benefit Nourish the Backstretch, providing weekly meals and groceries to stable area workers at Keeneland and the Thoroughbred Center. You can sign up at www.keenelandselect.com. So a couple sales graduates this weekend from Keeneland hit the winner's circle, keeper of the stars. In the game league stakes, we might touch on her a little bit later. Uh, up and coming horse for for Jonathan Wong, uh, also United in the Charlie Whittingham. Of course, we remember United from running that close second to Bricks and Mortar in the Breeders' Cup Turf. Uh, he was a graduate of Keeneland November, keeper of the stars, Keeneland September. Also, Keeneland news this week about the summer meet. They've submitted a request to the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission race dates com- race dates committee to race July eighth through twelfth without spectators. And the five-day meet would feature 10 stakes races originally planned for the spring meet, including the Bluegrass and the Central Bank Ashland Stakes, which will be which will award points to the Kentucky Derby and the Kentucky Oaks. Uh, I'm su- super looking forward to that. It's going to be right before Saratoga, assuming it, it gets greenlit. And it's just going to be a, a great little boutique meet. We've talked about this when we talked about it on the podcast recently. Uh, kind of structuring it like Kentucky Downs, where there's not that many days, but it's action packed, tons of stakes races. Uh, what are you guys thoughts? I think it's a great idea. And it's good to see Keeneland come back. And also it looks like they cooperated very nicely with Naira. And it's nice to see that these tracks are working together, which is something we didn't really see because had they put this during the Saratoga meet, it, it might've caused some problems for Saratoga because Kentucky horsemen might've preferred to stay at Keeneland. They would be less likely to come to Saratoga. They put it on the last weekend at Belmont where nothing that major is going on. And yeah, it's going to be a little boutique meet, almost like a little mini breeders cup. I'm um, looking forward to it as well, Joe. I love the idea of the boutique meet, you know, ranging from, uh, you know, what Keeneland is going to do this year, what Kentucky Downs has done the past few years. Um, it's fun. It's exciting. It's it's great racing. And, uh, you know, as a fan, as well as somebody who hopefully will be competing um, there during the, the mini meet, um, what's not to love about it? There's going to be a ton of money. It's a great facility. And quite frankly, you know, this might be the new normal, hopefully, is that, uh, you know, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll consider doing something like this down the road and maybe bookending another sale um, there to kind of, uh, you know, have a, 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 an overlay of, of two opportunities. Um, but I can't wait. I mean, we're going to, as, as little racing as we had, that's how much, you know, excitement, embarrassment of riches as we're going to have, um, you know, starting uh, really in the, in the first week of June. Yeah. I mean, you guys kind of touched on everything. Hard to argue with. It's going to be great racing. I'm sure some really good betting cards, really competitive stakes races. So definitely something to look forward to. So this past weekend, we had our first real coast to coast action packed stakes weekend since the coronavirus hit. We've had these little pockets of races like the Florida Derby and the Arkansas Derby. But last week was the first week that it really felt like racing was back. You had a big weekend at Churchill Downs, you had a big weekend at Santa Anita. We're a week away from Belmont opening. Um, so it's going to be pretty much back to normal, back to status quo fairly soon here. And it was great just to have that kind of uh, be able to bounce around to Santa, Santa Anita and back to Churchill for big races all weekend. Uh, the lead story of the weekend is Maxfield. Uh, we're going to talk to Brennan Walsh in a little bit. It's super, super impressive. For a horse who didn't win by a ton, I thought contextually he ran a really big race. First of all, the layoff. Never easy to win off that long of a layoff. Hadn't raced since October. So basically almost eight months on the bench um, in the Matt win. And he really didn't have a great trip. He broke a little bit flat-footed. He got caught four wide going into the clubhouse turn. He got shuffled back off of a slow pace. I think that's the main thing. The pace in that race was very slow. It seemed like it was going to be on paper, and it was. 
It was 23 and four for the quarter mile, 48 flat for the half. You know, for the, for that caliber of three year old, that's a really slow pace. And he had to rally into that pace, had to go wide again on the far turn. And it was a little, little green in the stretch, shifting a little bit, but ran down New York traffic who had had a, that perfect two path stalking trip. I thought it was extremely impressive. I thought once I saw him get shuffled back on that clubhouse turn, I thought he was up against it. I, first of all, I was betting against him as much as I like him. I thought six to five off of that layoff against a pretty good field was crazy underlay. So I thought I was golden on the, on the clubhouse turn when he got shuffled like that. But, you know, the horse's talent prevailed, and that's, that's the ultimate proving factor when it gets to these three-year-olds. And I think that that showed that he is a class above probably the B-level three-year-olds, which was most of that field. So it's probably him, Tis the Law, and the three Baffert horses right now, I would say, is the big five as we start to head into derby season part two. Uh, what did you guys think of Maxfield this weekend? Well, I mean, first of all, he stole the show over the weekend. There were all these big races. But, you know, right now, uh, even in this weird year for the Triple Crown, we're still three-year-old focused. Uh, Joe, I would just really say ditto to everything that you said there. He was very, very good. And, you know, did he beat a derby-level field? No. But he, there was a decent, some decent horses in there. And we're seeing the same phenomenon as we come back to the races. I mean, the, throughout the Churchill card, 12 horses in every race, 13 horses. I mean, just these races that are just loaded. And, you know, if he had just gone out there and kind of won without any fuss and won by two or three lengths, he'd say, ah, you know, what's the big deal? But just like you said, I mean, it wasn't a horrible trip, but it was not a good trip. He had a lot of oak to overcome. He had some adversity and he handled it beautifully. And yeah, I, I mean, a lot can happen between now and September 5, but if you can give me some price on will one of those five horses you mentioned win the Kentucky Derby, I'm taking that bet right now. They do seem to have separated themselves from the pack. And Max Field does belong in the same sentence with them. No doubt about that. And you, you talk about, you know, the, the money involved and the money bet on the horse and him being a favorite. How about um, Jose Ortiz earning his money on this race um, where he had all kinds of problems, all kinds of trouble. And then down the stretch with probably a tiring horse because he was coming off a layoff since October. He just Ortiz just intimidated the hell out of Paco Lopez um, on, on New York traffic. I don't think I've ever seen that before where a jockey actually leans over and takes his arm and starts to intimidate the horse. Boxed next to it. What's that? He boxed him out. Like he boxed him out. Exactly. He was going for a rebound and boxed him out. And, and I was watching the race and saying, that's got to be an optical illusion. And I watched it, you know, two or three times with, with the, uh, the head on. And, and that's what Jose's doing. He's actually like, he's, he's riding, riding. And I'm not going to try to, you know, may replicate what he did because he's a professional athlete and I'm far from that. Um, you just worked he out. Enough. What's that? You just worked out. That's close. Enough. Exactly. Yeah. You can see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and he takes his arm and basically is boxing out the other. And Paco Lopez is like, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? He had no idea. And I think that's ultimately what cost him the race. So kudos and, and a tip of the hat to, to Ortiz because he definitely earned his money on that race. And I think he's definitely on the best horse heading into um, at least, you know, heading into June. Um, and, and the pre, uh, you know, Derby campaign, but Maxfield was very impressive and I'm really looking forward to watching him run next time out, whether it's the Belmont or one or, or the bluegrass. Um, but he is a horse to watch. No, no shocker there. Um, and I can't wait for him and, and tis the law to kind of match up and, and see, you know, who's best, uh, who's the biggest bully on the block. Yeah, I mean, it was a great performance. I guess the one knock I had was, it seemed like pretty much every winner at Churchill this weekend kind of made the same outside move it seemed like the outside was maybe a little better um so i think in that way i mean maybe you'd knock a little bit and the figure wasn't great but certainly did everything right off the layoff you know like joe said he overcame some trouble i thought pneumatic we ran pretty well and it's kind of the other horse i'd want out of there um he was lightly raced drew the rail kind of did a lot of the dirty work on maybe the worst part of the track so i thought he was definitely one to watch going forward um you know lightly raced well-bred asmussen horse certainly has the credentials to make some noise later on uh, there's a bunch of other good racing over the weekend. Even at Churchill on the undercard, we had the return of Sharon, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf winner last year, uh, TDN Rising Star. She looked, she, she, I was a little more work, workman like performance, but I thought she ran well in there. Um, Santa Anita, we had Raging Bull on Monday in the grade one. Uh, Shoemaker, that was, that, that was an interesting race, I thought, because the pace was so hot. 
it was pretty much a foregone conclusion that the front runners were going to come back to the field. And you had two Chad Brown horses, the two favorites, Raging Bull with Joel Rosario and without parole with Arad Ortiz Jr. And they took completely different paths in the race. Raging Bull looped the field and Arad tried to get, I thought, pretty cute aboard with, without parole and tried to needle his way through horses on the far turn, which, you know, obviously Arad knows a lot more about riding than I do, but the one thing I do know is that when you have a pace like that, you try to stay the hell away from the front runners on the far turn because they're going to be stopping right in your face. So without parole, didn't get into the clear until like the 16th pole. And by that time, Raging Bull had fled the scene and without parole ended up losing second in a photo with next shares. So I thought that was a pretty good performance by, by Raging Bull, pretty powerful. I always thought a mile was a little bit short for him, but with that pace, he kind of had had the race to win or lose on the far turn. Keeper of the Stars, I mentioned before, up and coming, uh, Turf Mare in the Gamely, another stakes winner for the un, uh, grade one winner for the underrated Midnight Loop. Uh, so that that was a good performance. Even on Churchill, like some of the allowance and maiden races you had on uh, Friday, horse named Casual, it was another Steve Asmussen horse. It was a duel of her and Center Isle. It was a $1.5 million facing Tipton Gulfstream buy for Chad Brown. They both had big figure wins first time out. Uh, Center Isle didn't get off that great, ran third, I believe. Casual had to win a, a stretch duel, but I think she's going to be really impressive and, 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 and really promising going forward. She's out of Lady Tack, multiple great stakes winning Phil, uh, mayor back in the day for the Highland Brothers and, and Steve Asmussen. So she looked really good. Uh, Monday, there was a Curlin maiden winner at Churchill named Ocean Breeze, who got bet like crazy for, um, what's his, uh, for Wayne Catalan. And, and and blew them away, really ran to the money, won by eight and a quarter lengths. She's one to look forward to uh, in the future. Um, anything else, any other, other, other performances that stood out to you guys over the weekend, wherever it may have been? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. You know, you mentioned a lot of the a lot of the important races and everything, but to me, the most impressive horse outside of Maxfield was Next Shares, um, finishing second in the, in a deep Shoemaker Mile uh, in the Grade One out there. The horse literally got slammed and pinched back um, at the start, which unfortunately happens, you know, obviously in racing. But when they when when they were at the three quarter pole, he was fifteen lengths behind with basically two furlongs to go, and you know, and they were going 108. They were cooking on the on the front end. And he made such a massive move around the turn and down the stretch at 20 to 1. Um, it just really blew me away about, you know, just how well hit that horse ran and, and basically ran a winning race um, and didn't get to 60%. But that's, you know, I'm not saying anything new when, when I say watch out for a horse like Next Shares because he's a grade two winner and, and, you know, grade one place. But man, that was an impressive race after just getting absolutely flat footed, you know, stopped in the very beginning of a one mile race. I think he's a, he's a grade one winner, right? Did he win the Shadwell? Um, I think that was other, I think that was Bowie's hero. Yeah. I, I, oh no. You know what? You know what? Yeah, Brian, sorry, you're right. He won, he won the Shadwell back in uh, October of 18. You're right. I'm sorry. He is, you know, he is a grade one winner, but I know he was a grade two winner, but now it's, it's less impressive because he's a grade one winner. So. Yeah, he's a nice horse though. I'm yeah, nice a fan of our charge. Fan of our charge, right. So I've always watched him. Um, I'm with Joe on the Catalano horse on Monday. I think she's pretty nice. I mean, she got just crushed on the board. Um, and just kind of always looked like a winner. She just had that. She was just sitting there, just loaded the whole race and really blew them away. A couple other horses I wanted to mention from Santa Anita on Monday. Uh, they're in the uh, grade three, I believe, or is it the grade two Monrovia? Grade two Monrovia stakes are five and a half furlongs on turf. Jolie Olympica is a horse who Bill's written about before. She was undefeated in Brazil, came here, won first out in the last Cienegas, and then just got run down when setting the pace going a mile next time out. Turns out the horse who beat her, Keeper of the Stars in the Buena Vista, now has proven herself legitimate by winning the game and winning it pretty convincingly. Jolie Olympica cut back to five and a half furlongs on Monday. And, you know, it wasn't a super easy win, but she sat off the pace and, and ran down the front rider. He's got a 103 buyer. So she's one to look look for look out for in the sprint division and possibly the miler division. Richard Mandela was talking about stretching her back out to a mile. She's by Drosselmeyer, so you would think, you know, with, with that kind of breeding, she could get a mile. Didn't do it the first time, but probably get another chance in the future. And there's just one more horse, uh, horse trained by Cliff Sice named Secret Keeper, 
into mischief, first time starter um, on the Santa Anita undercard Monday, ran down a three to five Bob Baffert horse named Fierce for Sewell, who was a $650,000 OBS march by. That horse broke like a shot, got clear, and Secret Keeper just kept coming and coming and coming and ran down that Bob Baffert horse for the Y Gods. Obviously, a very impressive ownership and family and, and breeding family. So that's one. And that was only five and a half furlongs. You would think that she's going to get better going forward. So that's another one I'd be looking forward to um, down the line. Probably going to be better off stretching out. But yeah, it was a great weekend of racing. And it's just, it's great to have news. It's great to have ex- horses to be excited about. Um, new horses coming on the scene. And let, let me not be remiss and mention the headliner of the weekend, Blue Buff, on Sunday at Gulf Street for DJ Stables. A uh, favorite of the show, and actually did really run a re- really good race. It was a it was a first level allowance, and it was a sloppy track. He'd never been on the slop before, and usually kind of a front runner stalker type was way 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 back there and ran down a long shot to get up. John, congrats! Yeah, no, well, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. You know, the, the horse was off for for over two years, and and has done nothing but good things since we put him back on the dirt. He's Four and one four in a row, and he's five for five on the Gulfstream uh, dirt. Um, and he's just been a really fun horse to have around. And and he's he's one of those where yeah, he's winning, so you like him. But personality wise, he's got a really cool personality. He's like the Bill Finley of the barn. <laughs> the what, what does that mean, John? <laughs> yeah. He's the kind of horse you want to hang around with and pick his brain and really get to know better. Uh, but uh, no, but he's, uh, you know, he's just been a really fun horse to have a fun, a funny side note. I got a lot of really nice texts and, and emails from people, you know, congratulating us. And I got a text from a guy in Costa Rica who said, Mr. Green, um, if possible, could you please negotiate the breeding rights to Blue Buff. He's really impressive. And I ended up calling my dad and said, hey, dad, how ethical is it that we try to sell the breeding rights to our gelding? <laughs> But it was really, really fun to, to have a horse like that. And uh, he, he does, he, I appreciate you you're bringing him up. Believe me, he, he does not you know, deserve to be in the same uh, breath as some of these other horses we're talking about. But he's, he's a favorite of mine. So thank you, Joe. I appreciate he's, that. I mean, he's, he's, he's a stakes horse, I think, eventually. And he's wow. got to have a cool personality to come back from that layoff and, and still be running well. So yeah. I'm with you on that. We're, we're hoping that. We're hoping the next time out, he's gonna, we're going to step him up into some stakes class because he really didn't like the slop at all. Um, and he did that just on sheer will and grit. What kind of figure did he get, John? Um, you know what, Brian? To, to be honest with you, I didn't look it up yet. I know on the thorough manager, I think he ran a five. Um, but I didn't look to see what he ran on the, on the buyers yet. Um, but, but that's a good question. But my guess is it's probably going to be somewhere in the, in the low 90s at this point. But he's, slowly, he's slowly working his way up. And they have that like starter stakes series at Gulfstream, right? He's got to be eligible for those. Yeah. Those so in, in December, the lucrative. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. But exactly. They have, I think they run, I think they run some other starters like every few months. They run a little like 60 granders. I got to think. Yeah. Yeah. They, they definitely, deadly do. In those. They definitely do. Well, one of the things, again, not to get off on a tangent, one of the things we're hoping is that at Keeneland, they're going to write a starter allowance um, that we can ship him up there for because mm-hmm. he is Kentucky bred in the KTDF. And yeah, right. the breeders are actually friends of ours. So, um, it'd be nice for him to come back to Kentucky and, and try that strip, but it's tough to bring him out of Gulfstream when he's doing as well right. as he's doing there. 86 was, was the buyer figure for him. Yeah. Um, and just that. on a personal gripe, I singled him in the pick five on Sunday at Gulfstream and I got DQ'd on some garbage in a previous race and that cost me several thousand dollars. So thanks to the Gulfstream stewards for that. Let's end the segment on that. Yeah. Segment. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where, where would we be without a disgruntled, uh, you know, uh, uh, he podcaster, right? We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. This week's news is sponsored by West Point Thoroughbreds. Owning a multiple graded stakes winning racehorse like Hard Not to Love is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. 
So the wait is over for West Point. Obviously, like the rest of the racing world, they had to had to endure the shutdown and not too much action, but they got lots of racing action this week. They have seven running at Churchill Downs alone. Um, and the big spotlight will be in on the horse in our intro, the uh, grade one winner now, hard not to love, as she tackles the Santa Maria Stakes Saturday, it's, or it's rather Sunday at Santa Anita, going for her third greatest stakes victory since late December. Potentially a rematch with CeCe, who beat her in the Beholder Mile and then went on to win the Apple Blossom in a really great race over Ali's Candy. Should be a really exciting week for West Point. Also, the two-year-olds are starting to run. Um, so we wish them all the best of luck. We're happy to see them racing again in those iconic yellow and black silks. So uh, best of luck to our friends over there. And we're looking forward to seeing Hard Not to Love. Really cool horse as well. We're going to have a lot of allegedly sprinkled in to this, uh, this, this news segment. Uh, there was a report yesterday, or a couple reports, one in the DRF, one in the Louisville Courier Journal about um, horses testing positive from the Bob Baffert barn on Arkansas, in the Arkansas Derby card, one in the Arkansas Derby and one elsewhere on the card. Um, obviously, this is, this is just an allegation at this point. It's, it's unproven. Uh, the Oakland people didn't even really, when Bill called them, they weren't even really specific about what, who the trainer was, but you could kind of put two and two together. Um, obviously would be, would be an issue if one of these horses did test positive going forward for the Derby. It's not going to look good for the sport to have one of the top favorites for the Kentucky Derby have a recent positive drug test on his resume. Uh, I will say that Bob Baffert did release a statement and saying that he's disappointed that this leaked so soon because they're still waiting for the split sample test results. Um, and that will either confirm or refute the initial positive test. Uh, Bill did some reporting on this yesterday. I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, I mean, a lot of thoughts about this. And not from my reporting, but from some of the other reports that came out, we do, uh, if, if they are to be believed, and there's no reason to believe that they, there is anything wrong with the reporting in the New York Times, they have a story now that said Charlatan and Gamine were the two horses that tested positive, and they tested positive for the drug lidocaine. Now, you know, put this in perspective it's not a huge deal because we see this sort of thing with trainers all the time, you know, a little sort of niggling. And I don't want to downplay this too much because look, you know, got to play by the rules. You shouldn't be having drug positives, et cetera. But this is not Jorge Navarro and Jason service. This is not, if indeed it's the lidocaine, this is not a guy pumping horses allegedly full of drugs to get them to go run their eyeballs out on a Saturday afternoon. This is, Perhaps somebody who slipped up, uh, got something wrong, uh, maybe gave the, the drugs the wrong time to the horse, et cetera. Now, you know, trainers have to be better than that. They can't be sloppy. They've got to play by the rules. But, Joe, I, I think you hit on one thing is that, you know, those of us will sit here and, and kind of understand what this is all about and try to put it in perspective like I just did. But what is this going to do for racing's image again? I mean, how many black eyes can this sport keep taking? Just, I mean, it's just one after another, after another. And, you know, we haven't heard from PETA yet. Certainly we will. And, you know, if, if, if Charlatan is indeed the horse that tested positive and he's running in the Kentucky Derby as the favorite, you know, that's going to be one of the narratives of the Kentucky Derby. And, you know, with all the things that have been going on, that's the last thing horse racing needs. You know, uh, I don't know what else to say. It's, it's frustrating and kind of depressing to be honest with you. Yeah. And Bill, just to dovetail on that, the only other thing I have to say about this is I would have loved for, for Baffert or for his camp to come out and say, we're innocent. We're waiting for the split test. And once that comes out, it'll prove that this is not an issue. And, and instead, and I know there's probably legal ramifications as to why he sent one statement out. And that's the only thing that, that, that went out there. But the statement didn't say anything like that. The statement said, I'm really disappointed that this isn't confidential anymore. And I understand that, you know, when you're trying to get horses ready for the Kentucky Derby, that you want to focus on the horses and their well-being and promoting the sport. But, you know, the, the jaded part of me says if they really felt like that they were a thousand percent innocent, that that would have been the leading statement to say is we're innocent. That's why we asked for the split sample to be tested. They didn't say that. So, again, this is just my feeling and my insight on it. But God, I would have loved for him to pound the table and said, you know, for the love of God, man, we're innocent and we're going to prove it. That's not what came out of that camp. Yeah, I mean, I don't honestly really know what to say about this. I, I, I thought the Justify story last year was going to be this huge thing, the end of racing, all that. And it really kind of blew over. Um, 
And I kind of have a feeling it's going to be the same thing. I mean, with some of these guys, it's just always, it's always an accident. It's always contamination. It's always, we bought dewormer at the wrong place and that kind of thing. It's just kind of tiresome. I mean, we have rules for a reason. Even if it's an accident, I would think that the greatest trainer of all time could maybe do a better job of overseeing things. I mean, I'm sorry. I might disagree on one thing. I don't think this is going to blow over. I really don't because, you know, this, this involves the most high profile trainer in the sport. It involves a horse that could be the favorite for the Kentucky Derby is presumably going to run in the Belmont stakes might win that. And, you know, it's, coming on the heels of all the other things that have gone wrong in racing. Number one, of course, all the breakdowns at Santa Anita last year, and then the service and Navarro indictments. And I just think I'm afraid that there's going to be sort of a piling on mentality from the mainstream media and people that are, are horse racing's enemies. And, you know, it's, it's, I don't know where to go with this. I mean, it's not like, again, it's not, service in Navarro. But then again, like you said, it shouldn't have happened. And, you know, we don't know the full story here. Again, I guess we don't even know if it's true yet, but uh, we will certainly find find out. But, uh, you know, if in fact this happened, they screwed up and they have to pay the penalty. But I don't think this is going away. I'm, I'm not as optimistic about that as you are. I mean, I I would say my take on it blowing over is the opposite of optimistic. I think it's just, I mean, Nobody cares. How much more cares. like racing is uh, we shoot ourselves in the foot every day. I mean, we get piled on all the time. It doesn't really matter. It's just people think of horse racing as dirty and a bunch of rich people and a bunch of cheats. And it's probably going to continue to be that way for the foreseeable future until we actually have a zero tolerance policy on, on things and actually, you know, really stick to these rules and stuff. But I mean, well, and this is also coming on the heels of, um, the, uh, the test positive for a class B drug of, uh, Steve Asmussen and having the horse finish second in the Iowa was the Iowa Derby. Yeah. Yeah. The Iowa yeah. Derby and then getting now being DQ'd. And I know that race happened a year ago. Is the, why is this coming out now? Like, is the, is the testing that slow? No, there's no way it, it had to have been some kind of legal ramifications, which if it's legal ramifications and maneuvering, it means that basically if you read between the lines, there was a plea bargain involved. Um, again, this is speculation, but why would it take a year for this to come out, um, you know, from, from, from Iowa, which again, no offense to Iowa, but how many races, how many split samples are they really testing? The difference I, I would say between the, the justify and, and charlatan news is that this was the, the justify news came out a year after he won the triple crown and was already retired. So he really wasn't relevant at that point in racing circles. This is a horse who is on his way, if it is true, on his way to the Derby. And I think that it could be a cloud over a Derby broadcast or, you know, any kind of Derby festivities. I'm not going to say it's going to, it's going to ruin everything, but I think it is different in that it's more relevant going forward than the justify thing was. And to the Steve, to, to Brian's point and John's point, you know, in the Steve Asmussen story, we had TD Thornton report on it yesterday. It's like, there's always an excuse. There's always a reason, some environmental contamination. I read an excuse for that, that somebody was urinating in the stalls. Right. And that's really hard to police. It's You're like, not to do that? is that not a thing? I don't know. You guys are in the stalls more than I am. You pissing back there? <laughs> it's it, it's kind of it's kind of like when you're at a golf outing. It's like the natural thing to do when you're on the back nine is to the contaminate. Got too much information here, pal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I do it. I'm just saying that's the standard. That's <laughs> if we wanted to make this any more elitist, now we have a golf reference. <laughs> 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 racing references, but no, I mean it's it's true that it's like it's you know it'd be refreshing once in a while just to see a guy say, look, I, I mean he's not going to do it for legal reasons. Say, look, I. I drugged this horse. I got popped. It won't happen again. Blah, blah, blah. But there's right. always, there's, there's always an alibi and it's just, you know, you wonder how much these racing commissions are listening and accepting those alibis or whether there's any kind of scrutiny going on. And I think, you know, it's the former based on the results that we've had in racing. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds.
So Bill brought up an interesting point and we're starting to run uh, handle numbers in the TDN every day at Churchill and Santa Anita. And when Belmont opens back up because they're pretty much up hugely across the board at these bigger tracks since they've come back. And the question is whether or not this is a sustainable and B, a result of new participants in the pools or whether it's just, and this is kind of the way I lean, whether it's just pent up demand from people who, unlike Bill, haven't been betting Fire Park with both fists and are now dying for some from, for some real racing action. Uh, Bill, what are your thoughts? Well, it's going to be interesting, and we're not going to be able to answer this question for uh, several weeks from now when most of the tracks come back. But I have sort of a different take on this. Um, you know, it's great to see that Churchill, San Anita, et cetera, are, are up with these huge numbers in handle. But the question is going to be when all the tracks come back and we get closer to normal, is that still going to be the case? And I think it's just a matter of how you slice the pie. And let's take a look at Memorial Day, where, uh, again, Churchill and, and uh, Santa Anita had all these big numbers. And as they have been every single time, there were six tracks, thoroughbred tracks that raced on Memorial Day in North America, everything from the uh, Assiniboia Downs in Fonner Park to Gulfstream, Santa Anita and Churchill Downs. On Memorial Day 2019, there were 23 tracks that raced, thoroughbred tracks. Uh, the big one that was missing from Memorial Day this year was Belmont Park, but some other tracks that still, you know, get decent handles, um, Monmouth, Pimico, uh, Arlington Park, et cetera. Uh, so I think it's just a case of how you slice the pie. And if you look at the overall handle that's coming in, it's really the same every single day as it was in 2019, but you're just dividing up differently. So, yeah, you know, and I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think racing is really attracting a lot of new customers. I just think the economics of the game have changed and, you know, people have less to bet on. So, you know, some guy who might have been betting on Belmont last year is now betting more money on Gulfstream San Anita, or God forbid, uh, our friends at, well, not God forbid, that was God forbid. <laughs> but, you know, betting more on a park. <laughs> Um, I agree a thousand percent with what Bill just said. Um, there's some guy on Twitter. He goes by Crunk. I don't know what his real name is, but he's he works in racing in some capacity. And he's a really sharp statistics guy. And he's been posting some interesting stats on this stuff. So for Saturday, um, there was $59.1 million bet on 70 races. The same day last year, there was $59.2 million bet on 231 races. So it's really just like Bill said, it's the same money just being chopped up differently. If you were going to bet Belmont, maybe this weekend you bet Churchill instead. I think it's absolutely almost certainly just the same. I don't think we're picking up all these fans and there are other factors that are harder to weigh. I mean, tracks make less money on bets made through an ADW than they do at the tracks. There's that. And then of course, you know, the slots parlors aren't open. So tracks aren't making money from that. Um, so there are some more nuanced elements to this, but I think on hundred percent it's, it's not that Churchill is triple as appealing to people from a betting perspective. It's that they can't bet Belmont or whoever else is closed right now or Monmouth or whoever else would normally be open. Well, I think, I, I think at least in part, you have to give the credit to the terrific betting product at Churchill. Pretty much every race is full fields, high quality horses. It's like, it's much easier to make money when a track is running races like that, then the five and six horse fields you would get, you would be getting at Monmouth on Memorial Day with heavy favorites. So I think that part of it is instructive. And again, I lean towards contraction and the benefits of contraction and fewer tracks because you will have a better betting product at these other tracks. So maybe it'll, maybe in the end, it'll just, it'll balance out. And like you guys are saying, more money will go to the bigger tracks. But in general, I think the way to get people to bet more, if we're not having new customers flooding in, which let's be real, we're not going to have that, is to have bigger fields. And, by, and the way to do that is to have fewer races and fewer tracks. And it just, it's, it's, it's inevitable to me. And I think that's the other lesson to learn from this is that if you, you, know, if, if you have these big fields and these great betting opportunities, people will bet it. You know, I'm not usually a huge Churchill better. I usually focus on New York. Obviously, I would be betting New York if, if it were open right now, but I still have other options. I still have Gulfstream. I still have Santa Anita. And I'm betting more at Churchill than I used to because you look at a pick five or a pick four with four or five 12-horse fields, 
it's going to be more appealing than the normal product that would be out there when there are a million tracks running for no reason on Memorial Day. So that part, I think, can be can be remedied a little bit going forward over time. But Joe, that's this brings up another problem, though. You're right. The betting product has been as good as we've seen almost in our lifetimes. I mean, the tracks that are running, uh, the, the betting product is fabulous with the full fields and, you know, seven to two, four to one favorites, et cetera. But the reasons for that are that there's so few tracks running and these horses haven't had any place to run for two months. So they're all beating down the doors to get into the races. You know, three months from now, we're going to be back to the scenario you just said. I mean, maybe not five horse fields, but six and seven horse fields with three to five favorites. So, you know, racing is taking advantage of that right now, but it doesn't, it's not like all of a sudden, you know, one year from now when Churchill's running in 2021, they're going to have all these 14 horse races and everything. It's going to be back to, to normal. And so, you know, that's another thing that's sort of discouraging about this. So, uh, you know, it, it, again, I, too much gloom and doom sometimes in this sort of thing, but I think we have to be realistic that, you know, this is just a short-lived phenomenon and, uh, you know, racing is going to go back to the way it has been, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take maybe decades for tracks to close and consolidate um, into bigger hubs. And I just, yeah, it's not going to, it's not going to happen overnight, but I just think, you know, every, every single positive statistical trend and handle that we get during the coronavirus has to be at least in part attributed to the fact that there are so few tracks running and there's bigger fields and bigger, uh, bigger handle because of it. So I just, I think that, you know, if there is like a, if there is a lesson to be learned from all of this, it's that we don't need 30 tracks running on a Saturday in a sport that handles declining, bull crops declining. We don't need all of this competing racing, especially in similar jurisdictions. I mean, I, I think contraction is inevitable. I think you said decades. I think it's honestly going to be quicker than that. I don't know that every track is going to make it out of this whole thing alive. Um, I guess from the, it's tough from an owner's perspective, because I do think there do need to be fewer races, probably fewer tracks, and it just it's going to work out that way. But it's tough to wait, you know, three months to run your horse and then you go up and you're, you might have been 10 to one or five to one in a normal race and you're 30 to one now. And it's, I mean, it's going to be tough on a lot of owners. If you don't have the right horse, you're in big trouble right now. I mean, that part, like Bill said, is temporary where the horses haven't, haven't been able to run for a while. But yeah, it's with fewer tracks, with fewer races, there's going to be bigger competition. And John Green won't be able to ship in to a five horse parks field and make $80,000 in a race where he probably would have been third or fourth at a better track. It's just giving away the secret sauce, Joe. Come on. I know you gotta be dying with parks, not running, man. You know, it's, it's, it's tough with parks, not running. Thankfully we're, we're able to kind of shift and be nimble and run at a couple of the other racetracks. But, but right now, you know, like Brian said, it's, you know, you, you have a race on the, on the board and you say, okay, that's the one I'm shooting for next week. And you get in and you're like, you're, you're also eligible with, you know, a full field, four to six also AEs and nine excluded. And the only reason why you don't get in is because, you know, some, some, you know, uh, issue with like, you didn't get your papers in on time or at the same time that everyone else that, or you're not physically on the grounds. Therefore you get, you know, kind of pushed to the back of the entry form. It's not just the random lottery system that it used to be. And I understand why they do it because tracks are trying to basically protect their own turf. And I, I understand the business model behind it, but yeah, it's, it's a little frustrating on, on that front. Um, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, trainers and how they can make money. And, and that's, that's a big problem of it also is not being able to run. That's a perfect segue uh, into our last topic. We're going to, um, Dan Ross did a, a couple stories in the TDN in the past week or so about the trainers broken business model. First, he talked to a bunch of trainers and then he talked to a couple owners because it is one of those give and take things where if you're going to have the trainers be paid more, it's mostly going to come out of the owner's pocket and the owners are already losing money. But it's his main point was, and this some of the trainers main points were that, were that the trainer cannot get by on the day rate. The day rate is basically all going to expenses and very, very little of it ends up in the trainer's pocket. So therefore, you are dependent entirely on earnings. And as we've seen with something like the coronavirus, there could be times where you just don't have any earnings and that's not going to be possible or sustainable for anybody but maybe the top barns in this country. 
So it's the kind of thing where we we risk chasing people out of the business. And we saw what happened with Kieran McLaughlin retiring recently. I think that was a big shock to a lot of people that he was this is a guy that was near the top of the game, had great horses, great connections, you know, won a million great, you know, grade one races. And he's walking away to be a jockey's agent because I'm guessing he thinks he can make more money doing it that way. And, you know, that's that's a scary thing. And we've seen a lot of the stuff with the, the DOL in New York, finding these trainers, large amounts. Um, Kieran McLaughlin made a point in Dan's story about how a lot of people have said this about how the racing workers should be classified as agricultural workers. That way you don't have to punch in on a time clock and it's, it's, it's more finessed in terms of hours. Um, so that, that makes sense. I'll, I'll defer uh, to the owners here on, on some of it, but I think it's an interesting discussion because, you know, it's only going to lead to more consolidation at the very top of the game. The only people who are making money right now are just going to make more and more money while everyone else gets squeezed out if we don't fix this. John? Yeah, there, there was a... When I was reading the articles, it made me think of, um, of a movie that I saw years ago called Men of Honor that um, Cuba Gooding Jr. and Robert De Niro were in talking about Navy divers. And Robert De Niro gives a very big speech in the, very, in the beginning of the movie um, in front of all these recruits basically saying, I don't know why anyone would want to be a Navy diver. You know, there's no, there's basically no benefit in it. Um, there's no hype. You don't get any extra hazard pay. And if you're lucky, you know, you die doing your job. And, you know, quite frankly, it's very similar for a trainer right now, um, where you got to be part trainer, part vet, part immigration expert, part mechanic, part collection agent, um, chemist, um, accountant, you deal with temperamental athletes who don't speak English and are bent on self-destruction, um, egotistical know-it-all owners, um, shifty agents and mercurial jockeys. And that's a good day. That's on a good day that you have all those things going on. So it, it, you just, you got to scratch your head sometimes and say, why would anyone be, want to be a thoroughbred trainer? Um, and obviously there's glory in it. And, and it's great when you have a top horse and you get to the pinnacle, but it's so hard to get to the top. And it's so hard to get to the top when other guys are allegedly cheating and you're trying to do it the right way. So it's, it's a really tough job for a lot of trainers. Um, that being said, when I spoke to, to trainers about um, you know, the business model and, and aside from all the things that I just mentioned, they said that the two most important things are this. Number one, to have really good horses, obviously, because then you get to run for the big money and hopefully you get... Um, you know lifetime breeding rights if the horses continue to, to, to do well and, and retire as a stallion. But the other thing that I thought was very interesting that they said to me is, you need to have clients, you need to have owners that pay you timely. Because the last thing that they want to be is a bank. They don't want to have to wait to collect you know, for 60, 90 days. And then in the meantime, they're prepaying bills to all the other vendors that they have to pay. And then there's a shortfall in between. And that's where they get squeezed. That's when they start doing things like, not paying their their taxes or not paying the feed guy or not paying you know for this you know for the veterinarians and then you you get on their on their bed list that was a very close second if if there was a one in one a it's make sure you have good horses but almost as important as make sure you have clients that pay timely and that you're not being the the, the bank of trainer for them and yeah, it's not as much fun paying bills as it is buying a horse, but that's still your responsibility um, as an owner. Um, you know, that being said, I think it's got to be a two-way street also, where if the trainers are being honest with you and saying, this horse isn't good enough to win at a certain level, so I'm going to drop it down so it can win and possibly lose the horse and then not have that horse replaced, um, then you know, the responsibility is on the trainer to be forthright with you and tell you those things. I think that trainer owner relationship is, is huge because um, personally, I have been shocked to know, you know, how contentious it can be between trainers and owners sometimes and how many owners don't pay bills on time and leave trainers in the lurch. Uh, there was an idea in the article about maybe creating like some sort of escrow account for owners to put a certain amount of money in for unexpected expenses that pop up and then they'll either spend that money or get it rebated to them if it doesn't need to be spent. So I think that that's an interesting idea, but it's, I mean, like, like I said, it's, it's, it's unsustainable to have this much, <laughs> this much animosity sometimes right. between trainers and owners, because you're, you're supposed to be a team. Like that's supposed to be the team behind the horse. And you know, if people aren't paying bills on time, like, first of all, 
I can only imagine being a trainer. Like Sean McCarthy was the guy, the main guy that Dan spoke to. I can only imagine being a trainer who's like just scraping by. And I have like a multi-million millionaire owner who I'm having to chase around with phone calls and, you know, texts or whatever to try to get them to, to pay me the person who is like barely making a living. Like that must be incredibly frustrating and it must want to make you want to get out of the business entirely or dump that owner. But the problem is there's only so many owners. So a lot of times the owners have the trainers over a barrel and it's like, who, who else are you going to find that's going to put this stock in your barn? Um, so it's, it's not, it's not going to be an easy fix. It's going to require effort on both parts I think to, to smooth this kind of thing over, but it's uh it's, it's something that needs to be remedied for sure. Yo, I want to jump in here on this. And the, one of the things that I think that we've left unmentioned is the fact that all owners lose money or 90% of owners lose money or 85% of owners lose money as well. So the easy solution for the trainers is to charge a much higher day rate or to come up with some other kind of system where the trainer makes more money. Now, the only way to do that is to take money out of the owner's pockets. So obviously, owners ought to pay their bills and you, you know, and pay them on time, maybe even pay them in advance. But you know, there's no real easy answer to this question because you know trainers are struggling and they're trying to rely on people who are in a business where, by and large, you're expected to lose money. So you know, the whole economics of the thing is way out of whack. And you know, the train has left the station. I don't see any you know easy solutions to this other than yes, owners should pay their bills. But, you know, I think dump it all on the owners is, is um, you know, a little bit uh, not looking at their kind of situation as well, uh, that they're doing this for, uh, you know, playing a game where at the end of the day, they're probably going to be in the red. Well, the thing yeah. is, like, Harry Brogdon had a good point in the, in the owner part of, of Dan's article that, you know, this is a luxury item. Racehorses are a luxury item. The trainers need to survive. Um, this is this is their chosen livelihood, and they're the ones that are just scraping by. Yeah, it's 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 a losing proposition for most owners in racing, and that's just going to be the case because it's a luxury item, it's a toy for people in general that you should not expect to make money. You should you could should try to make money, and for a small percentage of horses, you will. But in general, it's for fun, it's for camaraderie, it's for a distraction. Um, in general, the trainers, I think, are the ones who need protection more than the owners. And if you're an owner and you have to pay $110 for a day rate instead of 100 like, and that's going to force you to take your horses away from someone, I think you've kind of missed the plot. Um, there was also an interesting thing in the article about how syndicates try to structure things differently where they don't pay a day rate at all and they just will split the, the earnings 60 40 for the trainer. Um, I don't know if you guys have any experience with that and whether that's easier or easier to make money or, or what, but um, that's another thing where if there's no racing, the trainers don't need. Yeah. Joe, the, the easy answer is stop paying for advertising and put more money into your day rate. <laughs> that's the. That's uh, I will say I've never, we don't usually do deals on horses and I think it's kind of bad on both sides. I don't think it works for either side personally. So we never do those kind of training deals. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more at www.greenco.com. So we're very excited this week to bring on the man of the hour as our uh, Green Group guest of the week, Brendan Walsh, the trainer of the very impressive Max Bill. Thanks for joining us, Brendan. Thank you for having me on, guys. Of course. Um, so we'll start with this. I thought one of the things that was interesting about some of your quotes about Max Field, obviously the history is he won the Breeders' Futurity last year and then had to miss the juvenile and, and be put on the shelf. I thought it was interesting, your candor and your quotes about how you would love to win the Derby, but you weren't going to sacrifice the horse to do it. You've been very patient with him. Can you talk a little bit about your training approach with him since he's been hurt and whether it was hard ever mentally or emotionally to stick to it? He, uh, the, only, the only reason I really said that was, you know, my approach always with the horse and with pretty much all of our horses is to, to let them tell me, um, you know, what they're, they're going to do. And I, and I knew this horse was a special horse. Not that, you know, every horse is important, but, you know, I wasn't going to, uh, to do anything, you know, knowing in my mind, you know, when you ask me, you know, how, how did it affect me mentally? Um, 
you know, knowing in my mind that I was going to mess uh, the horse up, you know. Um, you know, as much as we do all want to win the Derby, I, I was definitely not going to do that. So, you know, everyone tells me it was a blessing in disguise that uh, the Derby got moved. And it, it might well have been, but he's a very good horse and he seems like he overcomes an awful lot of things. And, I, and I, it wouldn't have surprised me if we hadn't have overcome that anyway. You know, we were, we were on a work schedule in Florida that the horse was... He was he was going to make it, but he was going to make it off of one prep. And of course, then you're, you know, the the experts are going to tell you that it's an impossibility, pretty much, to to win a derby off of one prep. Um, you know, but again, with him, you know, it, it was something that we we could have tried anyway, and, and maybe, you know, hope to bear with it if you like, and and, and just see if, if he was going to be able to take it or not. But it, you know, we took it step by step and day by day, and. Well, you know, it just depended on what way he was going to handle it. But in the end, we, we got a little reprieve and we were able to uh, to back down off a little bit and we were able to do it, you know, like he hadn't been injured last year. And we, we were able to take a fresh approach at it and, and do it the way we wanted. And here we are. Hey, Brendan, it's Bill Finley. Thanks for joining us. And I'll get right to the question that I, I know you've been asked several times, uh, and I don't know if you've made up a decision or not, but how about Maxfield and the Belmont Stakes? Is that likely to be his next spot? Um, you know, like I said, Bill, he, ju- he just went back to the track today. Um, we'd like to see how he goes, you know, for at least, you know, five, six days um, before we've got a more solid idea we want to uh, you know, I have to talk to uh, to the the guys in the Dolphin as well. You know, they've told me just to take as much time as I would need to uh, to you know figure out how the horse is doing and what he would be open to do. But it, it's an option without a doubt. Um, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule it out, but I wouldn't rule it in either. I'd have to tell you we're going there and then turn around and say no. But you know, it's it's an option. There's, there's a couple of strong options at the moment, and it's one of them. Brendan, I thought it was interesting to see that there was another Godolphin horse entered in the race, and then he, for Mike Stidham, and then he scratched. Can you talk about that dynamic? Did, did you guys talk it over? Did you talk it over with Godolphin? And, you know, I'm sure they knew how well he was training. Um, how did that dynamic work from your perspective? You know, like anything right now, I think, you know, we're going from day to day, and we're seeing – you know, I think they, they put the horse in there to have a look and see, you know, I think when they were entered, the book hadn't come out at Belmont uh, yet. And then I guess the book came out at Belmont and there was an allowance race. But I guess they want, you know, like anything at the moment, you're trying to keep all options open. And I think that's why they put the horse in there was to, uh, was to um, you know, take a look. And, and I guess if, if they were really caught out and it, it might have been an option to, to run the horse in there. But as far as, as we were concerned, Maxfield was always going to run in that race. So, you know, I just, I just concentrated on him and, and, and let the other, um, the other part of, of the entry take care of itself. Brendan, I'm going to shift gears on you for a second, because one of the things we were just talking about um, was just how difficult it is to be a trainer and how difficult it is to, uh, you know, all the different hats you have to wear, all the different people that you have to juggle. And then on top of it, you also have to take care of these great athletes. Um, Obviously, it's a little easier when you have the max fields of the world and horses like that in your barn. Um, But can you talk to us as a trainer uh, about just the difficulty of all the different medication rules and maybe what you would do or what you would suggest um, in order to try to make it easier so that way trainers don't have these one-offs or don't have these contaminated samples or things like that? If, if you could fix, or if you could make a suggestion to fix the, the, the medication issues, what would it be? Whether it be for or against certain medications, you know, and, and we've heard this a hundred times over, I, I think it needs to be one rule for everybody. You know, we were being told, you know, seven, eight, nine months ago when all the trouble was, you know, at its strongest with all, about all the breakdowns, how there was going to be a national body, you know, we needed to form a national body and, and, uh, and all this. Has somebody jumped up to form a national body? No. And now we're, we're back to probably where we were again with the COVID and everything. 
with our industry and with everything else, things everything has taken a back seat and, and you know, it's gone to sleep again, if you like. But you know, nobody's nobody stepped up to, to form this national body. Everybody's talking about they want to do this and they want to do that. Where's the person that's going to, to step up and actually do this? I think that's that's your answer. They're going to have to go down the, the route that they do in Europe or they do in Hong Kong, where you know certain medications are allowed or not allowed within so many days, and and that's it. And, and when people step over the boundary, they need to be punished. You know, and and. You know, I know there's you know there's thresholds and, and horses have a low amount of certain thing in their system or what have you, and you know look, we all we're all taking a chance, you know, with days and and things like that, and 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 people get close and and you know people make mistakes and and you know stuff does happen, you know, like. Like certain things get, you know, like people were saying yesterday, rules urinating in a stall and, and, and stuff getting into a horse's system. It can happen. You know, a horse can lick coffee off of a wall and it's got caffeine in its system. And guys walk around with coffee in the barn all the time. You know, stuff does happen. I understand that. But these things, these minor uh, drug offenses and that, in Europe, they don't happen. Because there, you know, there's a certain amount of days, and it's taken well back from when the horses are, are ran, and then the threshold level is very low, and 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 so I think if you go back a few more days, they're going to have zero of that in their system, and then when that when that's decided, this is this is what way it's going to be, you know, then when these people overstep the mark, I think then you know, unless they can prove otherwise strongly pro otherwise, then I think that's it. And, and, and you know, we have to, we have to, uh, you know, we have to punish these offenses. And like I said, we're, you know, I don't know, I think maybe, the, maybe these medications are allowed to get too close to, um, you know, to where the levels are, it's difficult to explain, to where the levels are, are risky. And I think it may it should be maybe taken a few days back, or the levels should be changed, or whatever, to not have it have such a thin line for error. And and then I think when that's overstepped, then I think then you know because like I said, stuff stuff does go wrong. And, and, you know, I had a an issue a few years ago with with a horse where you know my vet made a mistake. Partially, you know, we were partially responsible, I will admit, but, you know, there was, there was just a mistake made and, and we had an overage of anti-inflammatories and it was a totally innocent mistake and, and you know, we suffered for it. And, and these things do happen, but, you know, I think if there's a certain threshold level and, and, and something is, is above or below the threshold level, then, you know, but, but ultimately... I think there needs to be a governing body and, and they need to decide these levels and they need to decide everything else. And and I think that's where we need to draw the line. But somebody's got to step up here soon and, and you know, do this. This is kind of related to that. I'm always curious to get the perspective of people who have trained in Europe and then come here. Uh, I believe you first came here in, in 2012 and uh, you were an assistant for Eddie Keneally. What was the biggest adjustment that you faced when you started training in America, um, what would you tell the layman about American racing that you had to pick up? Um, I definitely had to come. It's a completely different um, different way of training here. You know, not, not completely. I mean, you bring some, some stuff from Europe, you know, that, that will fit here, but, you know, you can't come from Europe and apply a European type of of training method to the states and think you're going to uh, you're you're going to get away with it. even with turf horses. I don't think you can uh, you can train them the exact same as what we we train in Europe. And definitely, dirt people from Europe. If you're going to be a, a successful dirt trainer, you've got to come here. You've got to spend do your time with a with a trainer in in the states and, and learn because it's it's totally totally different. In what way? Um, I think dirt racing, the, the first thing that hits, hit me and it doesn't hit me now, but yet I, I tell people that come from 
young younger guys that come from Europe that are learning uh, to train, like especially young horses on dirt. I think you have to be an awful lot um, a lot more aggressive with uh, with the younger stock. You know, they have to learn how to how to leave the gate. Um, you know, and they they've got to they've got to have that speed, and they've got to be schooled with dirt and you know, like in Europe, you know, you can you can work a, a two year old, you know, five six times and and um, you know show up at the uh, at the races. He's he's jumped out of the gate a couple of times, and you know they'll they'll fall out of the gate. They'll they'll be able to set themselves and they'll run and and they're fine. But here, you know, you miss a beat at the start, and you're dead in the water. You know so. And and even in in you know European horses that come from here, I think it's it's important that they um, that they work um, you know from the gate and learn how to leave the gate because it's different. Again, they they don't you know you got to get yourself in a position here where where uh, you know you're you're able to put a tough horse into a position and and you're able to um, to go from there. But in Europe, you know, it's generally it's taken real slow early on. You get plenty of time. I think that's part of the reason why, you know, the European or the American, sorry, you know, people like Wesley's gone over to Europe with his two-year-olds. They're super fast out of the gate. They're really well taught. You know, he, he gets them out of there. They're they're rolling. They're gone two, three lengths before these European horses even see what way they went. And I think it's why, you know, the American, even the older American horses that have ran in Europe, I think we've probably been a little more successful with with sprinters on the on the turf than, than we have with anything. Because I think, you know, at the start they get they, they get a big advantage from from having been raced over here and learning how to break that bit quicker. You know, and and I think it's the same when they go to Dubai. The American dirt horses they've had a more solid grounding, and I think that's why they. They've done much better on the on the dark in Dubai. I think is a perfect example as well. Hey, Brendan, getting back to Maxfield, uh, it's well known that perhaps the only major race in the entire world, Godolphin, has never won is the Kentucky Derby. And can you get what sort of sense do you get about how excited they are about this horse, Sheikh Mohammed and his whole team, and how much they at this point do covet this this one win that's been elusive for them. I feel it's it's amazing, you know. I I worked for them back kind of, you know, late nineties, early two uh, thousands, and they were, you know, I was I was around there, and I was in Dubai. I did nine winters in Dubai, and I, you know, I was around them and their people a lot, and you know, back then maybe toward more even towards now, they were throwing the kitchen sink at. At trying to win the Kentucky Derby, you know they were they were trying to win it, you know, uh, have the horses in Dubai for the winter, and uh, and then bring them over here, and then they tried to do it from here, and they they tried all kinds of, of ways, you know, um, and it's it's very difficult race to win full stop, you know, uh, like Aidan O'Brien's come to try and win it the last time he he came, you know, he couldn't believe the. You know the way the the whole atmosphere, the day of the race, and just the you know I forget what word he used to describe it, but it wasn't very very subtle. Um, but you know I I do understand how much they they wanted to win the Kentucky Derby, and, and uh, you know they haven't managed to win it yet. You know they had a hell of a shot a couple of years ago with Thunder Snow, and it got killed at the to start leaving the gate. So you know it's. They really, really do. They really would like to win it. I think Sheikh Mohammed would really like to win it. Um, you know, and this might might be the best chance. Brendan, you've really your business has really taken off maybe the last five years or so. Um, was there a certain horse or maybe an owner that you picked up or something or a certain moment that you think was kind of a catalyst for when things really took off? Um, I I think the the main. You know the the main horse that I would and and people will probably not remember my claim the horse uh, my second year training a horse called Carry Street for ten grand and I owned half of them I I sold a piece of them but I, I owned half of them for most of his career and he won a 
He won a Greenwood Cup at Parks and he won a uh, Breeders' Cup Marathon, or it was the old Breeders' Cup Marathon in, uh, in California as well. And I think if he if he hadn't showed up and I hadn't got lucky then, I think, uh, you know, I might not be here today. You know, he, he was a, a hell of a horse. And we've had a lot of nice horses since and a lot higher profile horses since. But I think if he hadn't showed up, then I don't know if I'd be around. And that's that's why I look at, at some younger trainers now and they're struggling. And, you know, a lot of them, they were every bit as good a horseman as, as I was or anybody was. But you've got to get a little break like that along the way. Everybody does, um, you know, to stay alive. Especially, you know, I, I started pretty small and I didn't have a huge backing. So I, I needed something like that. And, and then, you know, we picked up because we we got some good publicity from that. We picked up some good owners along the way. And, and you know, we've, we've got a great roster of owners now. We're very lucky. But, um, but yeah, you know, you, you, you have to work really hard at it. But, but you do, without a doubt, you have to have a little luck. Because if you don't have that, it doesn't matter how hard you work or how good a horseman you, you are. If you don't have pick up them good owners with access to them good horses like we gained access to Maxfield. You know, if if, if I hadn't won the UAE Derby last year, who knows, maybe I wouldn't have Maxfield. You know, and at one point we weren't really going to go to Dubai with Chris Kapalfi last year. So it's funny how things work out. For sure. And uh, you've been lucky enough to get Maxfield. We've been lucky enough to watch him. And uh, we, we appreciate the, the training job that it took to get him back to win that, that first race. How nervous were you on Saturday before the Matt went? I was, I was anxious enough, but, you know, going into it, he, he had been working so good, um, you know, and of course you're looking for confirmation more than anything. But he's the kind of horse, you know, he, he instills confidence in you. He, you know, he's, there, the days coming up for the race, and you know, he just takes over. You know, you saddle him, and you know, he does everything. Bar turn around and say, "Hey, listen, I got it from here. You just relax." That's that's the kind of horse he is. He, he's just he's an amazing horse. He's got a great mind, and he he gives himself every chance. And uh, you know, but we were anxious because his his work was. I mean, he put in a couple of bits of work for me. I you know, one in particular that I haven't. You know, it was mind blowing, and uh, and you know, you're thinking, God, can this horse actually be this good? And uh, so you're you're kind of looking for confirmation, at least that you're on the right track. And I think we got that on on Saturday. Right, Brennan. Thanks so much for the time. We really appreciate it, and uh, best of luck with him going forward, wherever you end up. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you, Brennan. Thanks, Brennan. Bye bye. Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Brennan Walsh will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust The Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit The Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's episode of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. A reminder, wagering through Keeneland Select this month will help support Nourish the Backstretch for stable area workers at Keeneland and the Thoroughbred Center. You can sign up at www.keenelandselect.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, Brian DiDonato, John Green, our Green Group Guest of the Week, Brendan Walsh, our producer, Patty Wolf, our editors, Nathan Wilkinson and Anthony LaRocca, and our production coordinator, Michelle Sabrino. Stay safe out there. We will see you next week. 